everyone, my name. Uh oh. Okay, here we go. <laughs> Hello, everyone. My name is Dr. Jasmine Nolan Eccles. This is work group three. And today we will have presentations by the presiding judge, Newton McCoy, followed by our commissioner, city councilor, Shana Hamilton, for a 30 minute presentation. So we will start with the first presentation from the presiding judge for 30 minutes. Whenever you're ready. Would it be useful for all of you for me to describe exactly what municipal court is in city government? Um, so municipal court is the court that is set aside exclusively to hear charges of violations of the ordinance of the city. Um, so that, for instance, uh, what we hear uh, consists of traffic uh, allegations of traffic violations. Uh, we handle enforcement of the illegal dumping and prohibited refuse cases. We handle uh, pro uh, property maintenance charges where owners of property are charged with not complying with the property maintenance code. Uh, we handle nuisance charges where nuisance behaviors are alleged to have occurred on posted premises. Anything that's provided for as an ordinance violation is what we hear. We are separate from the circuit court in that we do not hear any state misdemeanor or state felony charges. Those are heard in the circuit court in the Carnahan building or in the civil courts building. So we don't have any evictions. We don't have orders of protection. Uh, we don't have collection suits. We don't have personal injury suits. We don't have jury suits. Um, we have, because of the way uh, that uh, our state constitution is governed, we have several bosses. We are a city department uh, so that we are responsible uh, for budget and for a, a number of things. Uh, to the city administration. And, and um, obviously the ordinances define what we uh, do in terms of what charges we have, but we are also considered under the state constitution to be a division of the circuit court, which means we are also subject in procedural matters to uh, orders from uh, the state Supreme Court and our presiding judge on procedural matters and on procedural matters, what the state says trumps anything else, trumps ordinances, trumps the charter, uh, trumps any state laws that are inconsistent. Uh, so sometimes we have to resolve tensions between our different bosses. Um, so th this is basically uh, what we do. Um, so I guess I should stop and ask if there are questions about what we do. Maybe I should describe what our process is. I don't know. What would you all like to hear? Primarily, we would like to hear what your perspective on the charter is and how it impacts or affects your department. And if you have any recommendations or perspective pertaining to amendments that we should make based on your experience in your department and position. So Madam, that, oh, really quick, Madam Chair, would it, is it possible, um, before we get into that, is it possible, presiding judge, for you to maybe elaborate a little bit more on the um, distinguishing characteristics of your area versus maybe where there is an overlap with others? I think you mentioned like there's not a an overlap with um, um, certain traffic things or certain personnel um, pieces in terms of, um, you know, maybe uh, protection orders and that type of thing. Are there maybe some common misconceptions about what it is your your area does? We do have people tr try to attend sessions in our court for orders of protection and eviction suits and collection suits. And we have to direct them over to the circuit court because all those cases are heard there. If the, the substance of the case is based on a, only on a state law and not on a city ordinance, we don't have any jurisdiction of those. Our, our jurisdiction is limited to violations of city ordinances. Uh, we have a separate prosecution unit in, in um, uh, Ms. Hamilton's office 
There's a municipal prosecutions unit that's responsible exclusively for prosecuting the, those ordinance violation charges. Uh, the procedure in an abbreviated way is very much as it would be for a misdemeanor case in the circuit court. Um, an officer uh, issues a ticket in the field. Uh, the city councilor issues a charge based on that. The individual has a court date. They appear, they plead guilty or not guilty. Uh, the city councilor may decide to amend that charge uh, to save them the points or give some other disposition. They can plead not guilty and have a trial here. Um, if when they have a trial here before a judge, they're acquitted, that's the end of the case. Uh, if they're found guilty and a fine is imposed, they have an appeal to the circuit court, which is what we call a trial de novo. Uh, that, in essence, is a new trial in the circuit court from scratch. The reason it's from scratch is that we are not a court of record. There's no transcript or recording made of our sessions. And so when you have a trial de novo in the circuit court, there is a recording made at that point. Um, so um, we are supposed to be more informal uh, than the circuit court. Um, many, Most of our defendants are not represented by lawyers. Uh, so part of what we do is to uh, try to make sure that people understand our processes, understand what their rights are so they can make some intelligent decisions about it. Uh, so we don't have any orders of protection. That's over. If you want an order of protection, you have to go to the civil courts building. I think they're on the seventh floor, but, 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 but there's a location where that's done. We do not do that. We don't have the authority to do that. That's um, helpful. Yes, Thank you. Yeah. If I could ask for a little bit of a, um, a clarification, I guess, about um, a couple of the things that you mentioned. This is this is really good. Um, in addition to um, what uh, 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 Dr. J uh, Nolan Eccles mentioned that um, that we'd like to be able to hear from you about, um, I at least pers personally, and I think as part of the the of the 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 consideration process that we're all going to be going through um, would appreciate a, a better understanding if the models that you just mentioned and the processes that we have uh, within your 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 area um, are in fact the standard processes that um, uh, that occur in other um, in other cities with municipal courts as well or if there are um, uh, other ways that some cities may be, in fact, um, handling some of the processes that you're talking about, traffic uh, violations, uh, uh, you know, um, stickers, uh, you know, all of the vehicle stickers, et cetera. Are there other ways that these are being handled in other cities that you might think are, um, are in fact, models that we should be considering as part of this whole process? So just, just a couple of thoughts there. So um, uh, we are, because we're subject uh, to the supervision of the Supreme Court, our procedures are mandated uh, by Rule 37 of the Missouri Rules of Civil Procedure. So we have to follow the procedures that are set forth in that rule, and that's uniform throughout the state. The Supreme Court also has what they call minimum operating standards, which were instituted in sort of the post-Ferguson environment. Um, and so those are made part of uh, Rule 37. We are required to follow those. Uh, we are about, starting on Monday, to go live with a case management system that is provided for by the state, uh, which is supposed to provide for more uniformity in our handling. It replaces the current case management system that we have. So one of the goals of the Supreme Court is to achieve uniformity uh, across all municipal courts for the things that the Supreme Court uh, uh, thinks is essential or to conform with state law or to avoid other courts becoming what we had earlier um, in the 2010s, becoming renegade courts uh, mm -hmm. so that they have supervision that, that none of that happens. We do have the ability to do some innovations, uh, special programs here, uh, but we have to fit those in to those mm -hmm. uniform procedures. Um, mm -hmm. From our point of view, for the charter, the ch for the charter, less is more. 
Uh, and I say that only because when you are modifying the charter, you're going to have something that's going to be there unless and until there's a vote of the people to change it. Um, so our general philosophy is that charter provisions for uh, city court should be as brief as possible, limited uh, to the essentials, um, so that we we'll have the flexibility to comply with future changes that we get from the Supreme Court or changes in legislation uh, from the Board of Aldermen or state legislation. Um, if there's too much detail in the charter provisions, uh, we lack flexibility to move to either accommodate those changes in law or to innovate here. Um, and so I do, when, when we get to it, I do have some suggestions about what the current charter language is. I would like to hear what your suggestions or recommendations are pertaining to what you think pertaining to your department as the current charter stands. Okay. So am I able to share right now? Okay. So I'm going to try to do that. You be able to share, Shana? I'm not sure. Okay. Uh, well, um, then I'm just going to talk about this. I don't know if um, you're able to see our article uh, uh, um, in the charter right now or not. Uh, but uh, we, we do have hard copies, uh, most okay. of them in front of us, and so we can we can there, there you go. pull them up and look at them that way. Okay, so start out with a section one then. Um, section one says there shall be two city court judges, they give the qualifications. Um, the salary provision, each of whom shall receive a salary of three thousand dollars per annum. Obviously, that salary provision is outmoded. So we would recommend that that be eliminated. And I'll just address that point really quick. We've talked about this a couple of times here, but Article 8, Section 8 says that the salaries in the charter are minimums and not maximums. So, you know, we've talked, the commission generally has talked about eliminating those numbers altogether, but the numbers are not determinative. So, um, and, and, I don't think there's a need to make other changes there. What you have in section two is the statement that the Board of Aldermen by a two thirds vote can increase the number of city court uh, courts and judges. Right now, our ordinance provides for four city court judges uh, and all those positions are filled right now. Um, so we don't, we don't need a change there, I don't think. Um, what I do suggest um, is if you see in the second sentence um, of section two, it may by ordinance divide the city into judicial districts and regulate the jurisdictions thereof. Um, we would recommend that that be removed uh, because the origin of that provision was when there were only two uh, city courts and they were divided into geographical jurisdiction, one for the north side and one for the south side. Mm -hmm. So you can translate what also those divisions meant. Uh, and we haven't followed those procedures in a very long time. Uh, all of our courts hear cases from all over the city. And so that's language that we would suggest be removed. And if you have any questions, if I need to be more specific about what that means, um, uh, then I can do that. But I think it's self-evident. I would like your specification, please. Okay. There was one black city court and one white city court. And so I don't think that's anything that you want to perpetuate. So can you tell us a little bit more about how your office has decided not to, I would say, be governed by that aspect of the charter and how you've gone about including or being inclusive versus utilizing the structure that the charter provides currently. 
Uh, that geographical decision uh, uh, division was abolished in, by uh, the way the ordinances were written long before I got here. I came from, you know, in, in 1986, originally as a provisional judge, uh, and it had been gone for a long time then. Uh, it's not practical in terms of how law enforcement uh, works uh, to split up cases uh, into geographical divisions like that either. Our law enforcement has to be able to put tickets in any court division from any location in the city. That's an efficiency matter completely apart um, from the derogatory connotations uh, of the geographical uh, divisions. Uh, so we haven't had to do anything with that for years. You know, that, that's been abolished for more than 50 or 60 years. So... Shana Hamilton, I'm not sure if you can speak to the ordinances that the judge is speaking to pertaining to this particular article. Is there a way that we have access to those ordinances or they are only on the electronic version of the charter? We can pull the ordinances and put them in your um, workers folder. Yeah. Thank you. And and that that's basically uh, chapter 3.08 of uh, of the revised code um which needs revision in and of itself there's a lot of archaic things in it uh but one of the reasons that we want to stay sparse with what's in the charter is so that we can have hopefully we have time in the future uh, because i know miss hamilton's office wants to undertake a revision of the code we want to be able to revise those provisions of the code to fit with modern practice uh, with the maximum flexibility. Commissioner Crossland, Commissioner Bobo, do you have any other questions for the presiding judge? Um, just a clarification. I think what I heard you say was that um, the issue of uh, the issue of the jurisdictions has been dealt with through ordinance already. And while um, language in the charter is important to change if we possibly can, that whether it changes or not isn't at this point at least going to affect that particular issue and how it's being dealt with. Is that correct? I think that's correct. Okay. The, the reason I ask this is because as we're um, as we're meeting with people and going through this whole process, we are discovering many, many inaccuracies within the charter itself. But quite frankly, as we all understand, there's going to be a limit to the number of things we can put on the ballot. So then the question becomes, what do we change through ordinance or has been changed through ordinance that it would be nice to change the language on in the charter versus what's imperative to change? And so that's why I'm I'm asking for this uh, this clarification. Is there anything um, at this point that you would like to point out that you think that because it is in the charter itself that it may in fact rise to this issue of of needing to uh, needing to go on the ballot next year? Um, well, I'll just mention the other things that jumped out at us. I mean, I don't think the technical language um, in terms of uh, outmoded usage uh, needs necessarily to go on the ballot. Um, there is one provision uh, in section three, which basically misdescribes uh, the jurisdiction on appeal uh, and that I do think uh, is important to correct because it refers uh, to tribunals that no longer exist. So number one, the city cannot appeal anymore. By Supreme Court order, city's not allowed to appeal. Um, Secondly, uh, the uh, Court of Criminal Correction uh, does not exist anymore. Uh, the trial de novos, uh, which people can have, go to the circuit court after trial here. The provisions of the fines need to be eliminated because we don't want to be bound uh, by that. Um, so th the recommendations that we've made with respect to section three, I think really are essential. Um, and we can provide Ms. Hamilton, she may have already seen it because I circulated a draft of these changes some months ago when we were requested uh, to make recommendations. Right. Um, 
I have not seen it, but if you send it to me, I will add it to the work group folder. Okay. All right. I will do that. Um, so let me see what I'm looking at here. Um, um, the, uh, the clerk section, section four, um, uh, the clerk is now called the court administrator. That may not necessarily be a change that needs to be made. And again, there's a provision in there for salary, which we've already discussed. Um, and so those are the changes we would suggest. And as I say, with respect to the charter provision uh, for the court, we think less is more. Uh, and that sounds like maybe it's consistent with your concern that you don't wanna have to put too much on the ballot. No. I want to, if we could hear from Commissioner Bova with any questions that she may have pertaining to your your suggestions, presiding judge. Well, really quickly, um, Commissioner Crossland, did you have any other questions? I didn't want to interrupt. Uh, oh, I didn't know. simply uh, whether there was anything having to do with the courts that are in other parts of the charter uh, with areas or departments, et cetera, with whom you have to work within the city charter, are there any um, issues there that you would want to be able to point out as well? Um, well, um, the security uh, for our courtroom and the building is provided by the city marshals that are part of the police department now. Um, and so I imagine that there'll be discussions of that uh, when you have discussions with the city marshals, if you have them separately. Uh, they're a division of uh, the police department right now. Uh, we have a shortage of um, uh, people who um, are marshals to provide courtroom security. Uh, we would like to return to more in-person sessions. Many of our sessions are virtual right now. That was instituted uh, as part of a response to COVID, uh, but because of the shortage of personnel, we might want to increase the number of in-person sessions, but we don't have the availability of personnel in order to provide security to do that. Thank you. Uh, otherwise, we interact with the uh, uh, the prosecution unit or the city councilor's office all the time. But again, that's not something that needs to be addressed in the charter. That's a good relationship. So I, th I think I'll interject. Um, I'm, I'm thinking that I'll need to review some of the recommendations that you've provided um, in writing that we can perhaps work through um, later once they're added to our work group folder. Um, and so I think you've touched on this a little bit um, and just wanted to provide you with room to elaborate if, if you feel uh, the, the need, but um, is there any specific language outside of what you've already stated that is limiting towards the work that you do? Um, obviously you can't predict the future, but, um, and, and hopefully this is something that's going to be reviewed uh, in another decade perhaps um, instead of a hundred years. But is there anything that you find that's that wording that is limiting or verbiage that's limiting to you right now, limiting the, to you and your office and, and the role that you all um, provide to the city? In the charter, you mean? In the charter. The uh, Except for what I've discussed, the charter doesn't provide a limitation other than to try to eliminate some of the most egregious archaic language and references to institutions that no longer exist. We are a highly regulated operation, uh, both in terms of budget from the city and, and procedural rules that come from the state. Uh, if we are limited in any way, it's because of the limitations that are imposed on us as a court by the state Supreme Court, not by the charter. Understood. Thank you, Judge. We appreciate you. Do you have okay. anything in addition that you would like to add before we move on to the city council's office for a presentation? No, no, ma'am. Uh, that, that's that's my only message. Less is more when it comes to this provision uh, in the charter. Um, and I think, as I say, I think that's consistent with your goals of not to put unnecessary things on the ballot. Thank you so much. Yeah. Commissioner Hamilton, the floor is yours for the next 30 minutes. 
Okay. You can start just as the presiding judge did, and we'll ask questions when you finish. Okay. okay. Am I excused, or should I sit to uh, see Miss Hamilton's presentation? You say you, you don't have to say if you don't lie. <laughs> oh, I'm 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 happy to see I'm your presentation. <laughs> uh, but 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 as Miss Hamilton knows, I'm a little over schedule right now. <laughs> We know your time is limited. We appreciate you for coming for the 30 minutes in which you made time for us. So if you have to leave, we're completely okay with it. Okay. Thanks very much. Judge, thank you. All right. Thanks, Judge. Um, so we have some members of the public. So I'm going to start with kind of an overview of who I am and who the office is. But my name's Sheena Hamilton. And I'm the city councilor. And I'm approaching two and a half years in this role. And I'll give an overview kind of of the office itself. The office has 85 approved positions. There are a little more than 50 attorney positions and more than 20 uh, approved support staff positions. And Judge McCoy touched on it a little bit, but obviously there's a uh, a shortage of employees um, across the city, I think. So when I joined the office, we were 19% vacant um, as far as those positions. I have added 10 positions to the department since I've come to the department, and two of those have been in the last 30 days. Um, now, with the addition of those two positions, we're about 14% vacant, and we have about 10 more employees than we did when I started. So that's just to give you a perspective. Um, why do I think there are vacancies? I, this might be important to your work as it relates to the personnel director. So, and and just some of the things that we're going to probably ask you to look at. Um, the city for a long time had a city residency requirement. It's in the charter. Uh, it is now preempted by state law and should be removed. So that's one of the reasons I think um, that the city had some um problems filling positions over time. It was a limited pool of people that you could choose from. And there was a hiring freeze for an extended period of time during the pandemic, which has been lifted by Mayor Jones. And the jobs in the city councilor's office are very demanding, in my opinion, and they do not pay uh, what you could make in the market as a legal professional. So I think that attributes to it. I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that it takes a while to fill a vacancy when you get one. Um, and so folks are being asked to do more with less for extended periods of time. And I think that all of those things breed um, turnover in go government law offices and government offices generally, but in my office specifically. And in my, my, as far as my direct reports, I have a physical operations manager and I have three deputy city councilors. The physical operations manager supervises the internal law department budget payroll, invoices, contracts, that sort of thing. And more broadly, um, she has a workers' comp coordinator who reports to her that manages workers' compensation for the entire city of St. Louis for all of our employees. Um, the first deputy of the three that I have is over the transactional space and supervises units that are stationed at the airport, at police headquarters, um, at our city development entities, and um, one of them is here at City Hall, and the one who's here at City Hall works on contracts, legislation, and special projects. And those folks in that transactions division that I'm describing now, they're moving, you know, half a billion dollars in ARPA funds through city government right now. And I would say that, and they're dealing with a new kind of accelerated pace of legislation that we have in the city. So I would say that that group is the group whose job has changed the most over the last like three years or so. The second deputy that I have is over direct services and supervises the municipal prosecution unit that Judge McCoy was talking about who prosecute municipal ordinance violations, our problem properties unit, our sunshine compliance unit and a claims unit. So these are kind of the people facing components of the office that deal with the public a lot more um, than some of your transactional or litigation lawyers. And the last group is litigation. We have a deputy that's over litigation and we defend lawsuits that are filed against the city um, and its employees most of the time if we undertake that representation. And then, um, and those folks are, their jobs kind of changed a lot years ago when the city took local control of the police and the litigation um, increased. The number of cases that we defend increased with taking on local control. We also have 
an affirmative litigation unit that's part of the litigation group and they file lawsuits on behalf of the city. Uh, we have about a half a dozen lawsuits that are with the state of Missouri where we're challenging legislation that we believe infringes on the city's sovereignty or we're defending legislation that the state doesn't think the city should have adopted. So to give a couple of examples of what those affirmative litigation lawyers do, that's a unit that um, came into existence when I got here. So it's the first time that the law department has had a new unit in like 25 years. And these are the lawyers that recently filed a counterclaim in a highly publicized sunshine lawsuit that was later dismissed as frivolous and recently refiled. They are the lawyers who are managing the litigation that we have against Kia and Hyundai, so for a public nuisance violation, and they're the lawyers that filed the lawsuit against our medical provider at our uh, city jail, our former medical provider. So we cover a lot of ground in the city council's office, and just to jump right to the charter language, I'm not requesting big substantive change in the charter provisions. I think that Basically, that language has stood the test of time and outlining the authority and the duties of the city's attorney. It's similar to the the city charter language is very similar to the county, the St. Louis County uh, charter language regarding the county counselor. And the sort of somewhat miscellaneous things that I would call your attention to are considering retitling the Article 10 entirely, because right now it's called the law department. And oftentimes, folks confuse this department with the circuit attorney's office. I don't know how they do that, but they do sometimes. Um, and so if you called it the civil law department instead of just the law department, I think it would make that distinction between the criminal and the civil for people. Our office handles civil stuff, all the stuff that I've outlined here, and the circuit attorney's office is responsible for all of the criminal stuff. Even the municipal ordinance violations that Judge McCoy hears, those are quasi criminal. They're not. They're not criminal. They're civil matters, right? So I think naming the law department, um, the civil law department, instead of just the law department, might help distinguish us in people's mind from the circuit attorney's office. And changing the title of my particular office from city counselor to city attorney might help as well because. Um, you guys know what the city councilor is and because you've read the charter, but a lot of people don't know, like city councilor, like what does that really, you know, do? When I got this job, people were like, congratulations, what does the city councilor do? <laughs> um, so just calling it the city attorney might help to distinguish it in people's mind. And city attorney is a commonly used term sort of across all uh, most major cities. So I think that would do it. And then we have some language in there that refers to associate and assistant city councilor. And although those terms mean something um, internally, they we don't have any reference to the deputy city councilors who really run the um, divisions kind of of the office. So referencing just, I think, deputy city councilors, attorneys and employees and then I think the language goes on to say something like, as approved by ordinance. Um, I think just referencing that instead of the associate and the assistant city council language would help. And the reason why those terms have become sort of out of date is because once you get your budget, it comes through a compensation ordinance um, and, a, and a city budget. And then there's a compensation ordinance. And the compensation ordinance refers to the attorneys in the office as deputy city councilor, city councilor, attorney one, two, three, and it kind of goes on like that. So the compensation ordinance does not refer to associate and assistant city councilors, which is why those terms are kind of um, less usable uh, nowadays. And I shared a little bit about what we do and what the charter uh, language kind of means, but I think sharing a little bit about how we approach the work might help. So before I came to the job, I heard the criticism that the city councilor is really the mayor's lawyer. Um, and so on day one, I called the president of the board of aldermen and the comptroller's office to introduce myself and to request meetings with them and later connected with every department head and every county um, elected official. So I attended the new board of aldermen orientation when we took our board and cut it in half uh, based on a prior charter amendment. And I offered one-on-one -on -one meetings with all of the alder people. 
I meet biweekly with a representative from the office of the president of the board if we're able to keep our schedules aligned, which happens most of the time. And ultimately, this office represents the city of St. Louis. So the city is really the ultimate client. And um, even with that, I've made an effort to make myself available and give advice to um, all of the elected officials and the principal department heads and, and such like that. And I think understanding what the city council does means understanding that the city is the ultimate client. And people may not understand that, why the city is the ultimate client, but the city is the legal entity. Um, it's similar to a corporation in that way under the law. So like a corporation, the city has units and organizations and boards and commissions like yours that kind of act on behalf of the city, but those are parts of the whole body. It's the city that has certain powers and certain responsibilities like collecting taxes or paying out contractors and vendors. And it's the city who's the legal entity that is allowed to sue and be sued. It is the city who pays judgments and settlements um, based on you know, the actions of the parts of the body of that whole. And so that's, we and we have um, ethics rules that regulate us. So Judge McCoy talked about how there are state laws and there are kind of layers of things that govern the city courts. There are also layers of things that govern lawyers in general in the state of Missouri. And so the Missouri Supreme Court has promulgated uh, professional rules of responsibility. And those rules say that a lawyer is employed or retained by an organization represents the organization that is acting through its constituents. And so when I say the city is the client, that is what um, that is based on. So as a matter of professional ethics, um, you know, which our law licenses are tied to, uh, the city is the client. And for that reason, the law department operates kind of as one of many risk managers in the city. And my central guidepost is the law. It's similar to like you, one of the work groups talked to the budget director. The budget director is a risk manager and, and a very risk adverse one, but that's good because he's dealing with the money, right? Um, but his guidepost is fiscal responsibility, like mine is the law. And I could kind of go on about various things like that. But the charter places the legal risk and the responsibility for legal risk in our office. And so the office resolves internal legal disagreements, accountability, strives for consistency, and by making the city councilor the person who advises people on um, legal matters and who, you know, defends lawsuits for the city or brings lawsuits for the city, it centralizes that accountability and fosters that accountability. I think the same office that gives the opinions also defends the uh, decisions that are made. So it's sort of logical in my mind. And that that's kind of what I wanted to cover and the few things that I think could stand modification, but all of them are miscellaneous. If nothing changed um, in as far, so as far as the titles and things like that, I think we would operate in the same manner that we do today. Any questions? Yeah, um, counselor? It, it strikes me as we were as as you were uh, making your presentation, especially the second half, that uh, because I did I did hear from a couple of the older older persons that uh, you know that they were concerned about uh, uh, about accountability issues, and I, I I understand this whole thing of city and that uh, city is the ultimate you know the ultimate client uh, um, and responsibility, um, but help me understand a little bit. Um, uh, are you hired only by the executive branch then, and are all of your employees subject to um, to uh, uh, to civil service? Uh, you know, who's um, is there any confirmation process that you go through with others who are outside of the executive branch, for instance? Um, um, I want to I want to understand that that whole process so I can better absorb what I heard elsewhere and put it all together in my head. Absolutely. Um, so the city councilor, like every principal department had mentioned in the charter, is appointed by the mayor. Um, and there is not a confirmation process for any of those offices. And um, I have heard proposals um, about, you know, reporting structure and about, um, 
removal from office, the removal from office is the same for all of the principal department heads, except for the director of the Department of Personnel. And I I think it's appropriate. And I've explained why I, I, I will mention just for your perspective and your knowledge that since I've been the city councilor, which again has been less than two and a half years, the city has defended lawsuits brought by this by uh, sitting alder people, uh, seven sitting alder people. Um, and you know, that's we've had several alder people because we've had a change in in the folks who have been there. But since I have been the city councilor, my relatively short time here, the city has defended lawsuits brought by seven sitting alder people. And it's their right to bring those lawsuits, but it would add an additional wrinkle to speaking on behalf of the city in the legal context, if this office were to report differently, need to be confirmed differently, or have the possibility of re being removed differently than any other principal department head in the city uh, by folks who are in sometimes actively litigating against the city and who have a uh, personal attorney-client relationship with people who make a living suing the city. So a question that does not exist today would arise then. So whether the way the city defends litigation or agrees to an injunctive relief or settles a lawsuit by spending public money would not have the question of whether that is influenced by one individual, the mayor, but by 14. Um, we also prosecute, we also have prosecuted alder people in municipal court. Um, Judge McCoy knows that. Um, and those are just things I think that are different from the mayor's office. We have, have not seen those same trends. I hope that answers your question. That's helpful. Um, and following up on that, Ben, um, the structure that uh, we use, the same question I asked the judge earlier, the structure that we use within the counselor's office, is this similar or different from the structure in other major metropolitan um, um, forms of government? Uh, is it? Is it? Would you consider it to be a, a best practice kind of a of a pro, uh, of a structure, or have you? Do you know of others that you think that we should be looking at as as well as as the current structure? It's very similar to the structure and the way that we're set up is very similar to St. Louis County. Um, they do have more generalists than we do. Like we're very separated into transactions, litigation, direct services, right? Um, and they're a little bit different in that regard, but it's similar to St. Louis County. I think it works for our current structure of government. I have seen variations on that. I don't think it's um, you can say that there's a commonality in the way that the city attorney's office operates in various cities. I think it depends on what the structure of government is, right? If it's a strong mayor, if it's a strong council, if it's, you know, but the way that our government is structured and the power is divided, um, I think it works for our structure of government. And basically what our charter says is that the mayor is the chief executive and so every principal department head reports to the mayor. Um, so that's. Commissioner Crossman, did you have any follow up to the questions that you asked? Okay. Commissioner Bobo, do you have any questions for Commissioner Hamilton? Not at this time. Um, I think I'm going to. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, kind of do a, another deep dive. Thankfully, uh, I have access to Counselor Hamilton whenever we need it, her, so that's helpful um, via email and, and other um, methods of communication. So if, if I find um, other pockets and areas um, where I do have questions, I, I will certainly reach out. I have seen um, language updates, for example, from other cities around our size, around um, kind of the the wording as it relates to titles and things like that, just so that it's easier to understand what it is uh, the role of the city councilor is. Um, but outside of that, I don't have any uh, additional remarks or questions at this time. Thank you. Commissioner Hamilton, I have a few. My questions are more so around when you stated that the city attorney's office is basically the city's attorney. 
what does that look like when there are personnel that need to be that need the legal advice that you are required to provide them what does that structure look like or does it entail because i think the issue that i'm hearing from commissioner crossland from the alder persons is that does that conflict require your office to defend the city against said personnel or is it what conflict does it create um so i i mentioned the rules of professional responsibility to, right because of that word right because of the word conflict i think people throw that word around a lot but the practice of law is self-governing and the missouri supreme court decides what is a conflict right and so the missouri supreme court has said that the client is the city right and so that's kind of where that is i think i think if i have your question right what you're saying is when an older person sues the city who defends that litigation the city the city counselor's office defends all litigation that is filed against the city and its employees if and, and under very limited circumstances we do not right there may be a situation where we refuse to de defend and indemnify a person if we believe that they are working outside the scope of their employment or their authority, right? So we did that, for example, in the Luther Hall case. We did not defend and identify those officers. Um, but generally, when litigation is filed against the city of St. Louis and its employees, the city counselor's office defends those cases. And it is not a conflict because a city employee or elected official is suing um, the city, unless, I mean, I, I can imagine there might be a situation, like if I was suing the city or so, that would be a conflict, obviously, but that is very highly, highly unlikely to occur. It, it, it hasn't happened in all of these years of the city council being sitting, right? So I find that there's, as far as my question is concerned, I find that there are some city officials, departments, um, personnel, that are represented by the city by way of their position with the city it is by historical context that some people have gotten or have positions with the city so that they are protected by this body that you represent. And at what point or what determines when a person should not be represented by the city, seeing as that the residents of the city I would believe would be the primary source of protection of some kind. But what I find in some of these cases that I'm looking at or that I'm seeing is that whether the personnel, whether the personnel should be protected or not by the city government or your office, what determines that and how do the people know what determines that? I think, like I said, in, in some of what I'm seeing and some of what I'm referencing, we have some city personnel, some city elected officials that have been given a safeguard by the office be just because they are personnel, regardless to the impact or effect of what it is that they've done or have did, especially when it comes at, when it causes great effect and harm to a city resident. So at what point does the city determine if the taxpayer's money is used to protect a personnel, a person that is a staff person for the city and when it does not. I think that that's not clear for me as a resident and as a commissioner, it's not clear when we decide which one or which position we're taking and residents aren't able to determine when that is or when that doesn't occur. So it looks like in some cases, I'm not going to say an abuse of power, but it looks like if I know I can work for the city and I know that the city is going to protect me in this way, whether I abuse my power or not, I'm going to be protected. So what do you say to that pertaining to what the, or the ordinances and the charter reflect pertaining to your terminology of your office is the city's attorney? Right. So... Without getting into any particular case other than, I mean, Luther Hall is the example that we use because it's so public and widely known, but 
we we make a determination about whether to defend and identify a person based on whether they were operating in the scope of their employment. So that's not something that's addressed in the charter, right? Um, that's just how we make those decisions. So I'm not sure that it's a charter issue as much as it is. You're just kind of asking how how we come to those determinations. So that's that's how we come to those determinations. And there, and I, I think what the root of some of the things that you may be talking about are it, just in the law, right? I don't know that I would say that this office is protecting certain individuals. It's just that this the city as a government entity has a lot of immunities under the law. And so the law protects people who are operating, um, who are, who are, serving the city in, in various capacities if they're operating in the scope of their employment and, and doing it in a lawful way. Right. So what I'm asking is specifically if they if a personnel that works for the city of St. Louis is not operating within the scope of their higher position by way of, and it's kind of alludes to the personnel's office a, a bit, but your office would be the attorney representing it at what time or what constitutes your office to do the opposite of what you're, what you're stating? If we have the information available to us to make a determination that the person was operating outside the scope of their employment, um, which the example that I'll give you is the Luther Hall case. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Do we have... Yeah, if I can just one follow up here, going back to the Alder Manic case, um, I think that uh, the concern that I had expressed was a, uh, in in one of the other work groups since I just ended up in this one um, a session or two ago uh, was that um, let's take the case of those uh, suits that were filed, the Alder Manic suits that were filed. Um, uh, there was some feeling that uh, that um, the uh, that the counselor's office was there to be able to defend the city slash mayor, but that they did not have access to legal representation to be able to advise them um, on their side because the people who would be doing that were reporting to um, uh, to the city counselor's office, which was um, basically defending the suit. And so there was a potential for, I guess, conflict of interest there, but mainly what they were talking about was the lack of, of um, research and um, and um, legal representation themselves. Um, and because of it, maybe they didn't always file the best legislation or the best suits or this kind of a thing. And so um, I think that uh, uh, you know there was there was concern at that point that they they felt that they did not have the same kind of access, um, even though um, uh, the counselor's office was supposed to be for everybody. So uh, the lawsuits that have been filed by all their people are not necessarily on behalf of the city. They're filing those in their individual capacity. Um, as just one example, one of those suits had to do with um, uh, a protest. So it was a protest lawsuit alleging that the actions that were taken by the police officers um, were unlawful. Right. So that was a lawsuit that someone was an older person were filing in their individual capacity, um, challenging the actions of police officers. Right. And so it, I, I'm not sure that it correlates with what you're saying. And another of them was related to Proposition R, which um, was a voter initiative. You know, it was an initiative petition. So it was challenging that. So the city either enforces or doesn't enforce legislation. And this was, you know, the will of the people, right? This was a, a ballot initiative that passed, right? So yes, we defend the city. And I think individual alders brought suits in their individual capacity based on a regulation that had been passed by the people. So those are a couple of examples. I'm not sure if I'm answering your question, but in those cases we did, um, the there were individuals bringing lawsuits against actions that the city was taking. 
Yeah, I think that's helpful. Um, I still, I go back to this, but what if, what if the alderman at this point filed a piece of legislation at that point that you felt was not in the best interests of the city. How would, do they have the legal, the legal structure within their own unit at that point, I guess, to be able to assist with the filing and uh, all of it? I, I don't, I don't understand enough to know, yeah. this, but do they have, so, do they have some unique, some unique um, legislative support, I mean, legal support themselves, or does it all come through the counselor's office? Um, so for the entire city, the legal representation is in the city counselor's office. So for the legislative branch, as well as the, judi the judicial branch, as well as the operations piece and the executive branch, um, all comes through the city counselor's office. I don't want to presume the makeup of the board of aldermen staff. I can't tell you what exists there. What I can tell you is what sort of support um, my office provides to the board of aldermen. And so whenever a piece of legislation is presented to us for review, we review it and we provide an opinion on it um, every time that an alder person provides us with a piece of legislation that they want reviewed. Sometimes that is before it is filed. And so they know what we're going to say. Sometimes a piece of legislation gets filed and then a different alder person asks for a legal opinion um, than the one who filed it. And sometimes that, um, but anytime we are asked for an opinion, we provide it. And I'll, I'll say again, you know, I attended the board of aldermen's um, orientation when our new board was installed, when we went from, I think, 28 to 14. And I offered one-on-one -on -one meetings with every alder person. I'm responsive to them, in my opinion. And I meet on a biweekly basis with representatives from the president of the board's office. So I hope that answering your question helpful. Can I add to, can I add to that question for just the sake of meeting Titus? Is there a means of, so the Board of Aldermen is only coming to your office pertaining to legislation or review? Oh, no. Okay. So no, they come for lots of reasons. She just asked about legislation. Yes. So maybe if you could elaborate on what the Board of Aldermen's processes are with said deputy in your office pertaining to like what the structure looks like. Because it sounds like there may be some again communication confusion and i don't know if we we don't i don't think that we address that in the charter revisions at all but it sounds to me like there is there is some communication confusion in what and how the counselor's office is utilized for the board of aldermen so that may be something that i'm glad it came up in our work group or in our process or whomever but maybe that's something you could workshop with them on or over and what they could potentially or possibly bring to you like in conjunction with the legislation because maybe maybe you will eliminate the lawsuits and all of the due process that's happening pertaining to people being upset about what services they're getting or not getting from your office um, and I found in my conversation with some of the older people that that's some of what I'm hearing. I'm trying to make sure I'm concentrating on the charter and the work of the charter and what's reflected in it pertaining to your office and everyone else's office. And I understand that people have grievances and those kinds of things. And those are things I think should be handled directly with your office in a separate setting or in a separate forum. But we none of it is reflective in the charter for us to address it. Am so, I correct or am I? I think a lot of what you said a lot and a lot of what you said is correct. What I'll say is for how the office is utilized, just I'm going to generalize it because I know that we want to particularize the board of aldermen, right? But as a general principle, when, when we are asked for legal advice, we give it. What you see in the charter language is that you see the city, the city council's office directs litigation. The city council's office represents the city. The city council's office advises the board of aldermen, any committee or member thereof, and the mayor and all heads of departments and through the mayor heads of departments, right? So we 
direct, we represent, we advise, right? And then we approve contracts and things like that. And we do that across the board. And Commissioner Crosland asked a question about legislation. So I address specifically legislation, but there are often times where we get questions about personnel issues. We get questions about all sorts of different um, things. So we don't just advise on legislation. They, whatever the legal question is, the civil legal question, right? Then we can help with, right? We don't deal with criminal matters, but with civil matters, we help with those. So I hope that addresses it. And of course, I'm open to talking to whoever wants to talk to me about. Um, and you're pretty good at that. Yes. You're pretty about, good at available. Uh, yes, we about, about that. Do we have any members of the public? I know we have some Q and A here that I'm looking at down at the bottom, or any members of the public because it is two oh one. If we could give them the opportunity to speak or ask questions if they have it, since we're at the end of time. And if you do have a question you want to pose, just hit the raise hand function and I um or or use the Q and A function. I think there's some, I see two anonymous attendee questions. Do you see them, Shana? Um, it says, isn't this work group supposed to be streamed live? And, and no, that's not, you know, our website um, details what meetings we're gonna have and how they're going to be um, accessible to the public. And the next question, Um, for Judge McCoy, is there a concern that going back in person will limit access and result in more municipal warrants for failures to appear? Um, so um, we have mixed feelings about virtual court. Virtual court requires people to have access to the internet if they're going to appear in a setting like this where we hold court virtually and everybody's able to see and hear each other. Uh, or we can have people use the telephone only to connect with us uh, if they don't have access to the internet or video. We have some individuals that are not capable of utilizing that technology that actually want uh, to have an in-person session. Um, and we are increasing our in-person sessions to try to accommodate those folks. Um, in-person sessions are more effective if an individual's primary language is not English and we need to provide a language interpreter. Um, uh, we are able to operate much more effectively if we have that person in court and we have a language interpreter in court physically uh, to avoid some of the barriers uh, to communication. Um, one of the other issues that we struggle with in virtual court is that occasionally people agree to a disposition of their case in virtual court and later on they want to argue that they did not in fact agree to it. When they are in virtual court, it's difficult for us to get a signature on a piece of paper where they have agreed to their disposition. So there are pluses and minuses. We like the fact that virtual court will allow people to, communicate, to join a court session from home if they have childcare issues, if they have transportation issues, uh, to do it from work if they don't have to take off of work. Uh, but we do have these challenges sometimes when people either are technologically limited or they need an in-person session for us to communicate effectively because more than anything else, we need it, people to understand what their rights are, what they're doing when they make certain decisions and to be able to hold them accountable to the decision that they make afterwards. And so there are trade-offs between those two things. Uh, to say that we have decided that we're gonna eliminate virtual courts, we're never gonna do that. We're always gonna make that option available. It's a question of what the mix is and what's most effective.
Thank you, Judge, for answering the question for our guests. Do we have any? I think those are the only two questions we have, Commissioner Hamilton. Did anyone raise their hand? Okay. Commissioner Carlson and Commissioner Bobo, if you have any other questions to answer, any other recommendations or suggestions while we have okay. Commissioner and Counselor Sheena Hamilton and the presiding judge. No, I, I really appreciate uh, both uh, the judge and, and the counselor being with us today and uh, and helping to clarify areas that I, I quite frankly did not understand um, well, still don't understand well, but understand much better than I did before. Um, my only recommendation, um, Dr. Nolan Eccles, is that we spend that we spend a few minutes at the end once we've thanked our speakers uh, to talk about prep for the next meeting, uh, since we'll have one coming up on the 9th of January. Do we want to do that as part of this session, or will we have another session prior to that next meeting? We don't have anything scheduled from now until the first January meeting. What I think we can do is allow our presiding judge and Tierra Thomas or whomever else is not a part of the format for the commission to proceed with the proceed with their day. And then we can decide to take five more minutes to determine what we are going to present to the total commission body. If you guys would like, I'm completely open to that. Thank you, Judge. And Tierra is actually the designee for Comptroller Green. She's okay. been designated relatively recently. And so um, Tierra's is, is role is like mine, where she's a non-voting ex officio member of the commission. Welcome, Tierra. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Welcome. All right. Thank you, Judge. <laughs> Thank you, Judge. We appreciate okay. you. Thank, Thank you. you again. Thank Bye -bye. you. And the okay. next meeting, for the record, is January tenth. January tenth. Okay. So and we've got we've got a couple of weeks, um, but yeah. uh, it, it, I since I'm new to this work group, I don't know what your processes are, and so one of the reasons why I appreciate our meeting together for a couple of minutes is just so I can catch up on how you normally do this. But um, but I would I would think that we want to we want to have some kind of you know designees in terms of who's speaking and what we're going to speak about. Also, I circulated a document uh, to you, Dr. Nolan Eccles, as a starting uh, sample of uh, what a one pager would look like. I posted it on the city site, um, a, a sample document on what it would look like uh, for, um, for that one pager that we discussed at the last uh, commission meeting uh, that we would be able to hand out to, um, well, that we'd be able to post on 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 site with the announcement about the meeting in J the January community meeting, but then also that we might be able to hand out that night that would help people better understand what some of the categories are that would fall within the charter from which they could draw questions and which ones are not under our pur purview. Okay, so Here, Commissioner Crossland, these are yeah. items that I believe we all discussed as a total body would be discussed only in our public meeting. Well, that and that's reference. why that's why I wanted to, I just want to make sure, number one, that I had sent that out, that it had gotten to you because um, I wasn't absolutely sure that uh, that uh, it, it went through the way it should on the site. But I, but that would be something then, I guess, for the agenda at the, at the January meeting. I just wanted yeah, to mention that, that. Everything that is pertaining to everyone being abreast uh, as a as a body, we all agree that every detail pertaining to the commission will be discussed, negotiated, debated, all of those right. particular items at the public meetings, not in any other forum, work group, or any of the sorts. Right. So we will bring up your one pager at the commission meeting. Okay, the agenda is on everyone's calendar for you to add whatever updates you want pertaining to agenda items. Mm -hmm. If there's an agenda item that you would like added to the public meeting, the place to put that is on the meeting agenda that's on your calendar. I believe it's set for the 15th of every month, if I remember correctly, but you can add agenda items as you would like. I'll take a look. I'll just go look at it then and see um, how, how to be able to add things. My my system doesn't work quite the same, but uh, but I'll I'll see what I can do to make that work. 
But um, yeah, as long as you've got that document, that's fine then. Um, and then I just got the question about what would, you know, I don't know who the chair of this group is and what you guys want in terms of next steps in terms of prep for the meeting. And so I thought we might want to spend a minute and talk about that. When we broke out into the commission, into the work groups, mm -hmm. no one was chairing anything. No one is assigned any particular method or way or responsibility pertaining to the work groups. They're more so for us to convene pertaining to the articles we were assigned. We did an agenda for our particular work group early on when we first started out. And we, myself, um, Commissioner Bovo, and the vice chair, we just kind of added to it as we went and we knocked things out and we did things or we researched. We just kind of worked on a flowing matter that way. We didn't assign any chairs to the work group. Okay. Great. And yeah. I'll, I'll just note okay. for the January 10th meeting, we have uh, confirmed the mayor's office and the register. And for the January 24th meeting, uh, the personnel director. Thank you very much. Well, um, yeah, a working group too had a similar kind of a process in terms of we didn't have a chair either, but what we did because there were kind of like three clusters of um, of articles at that point was we kind of um, assigned each of us to one cluster and it was our responsibility to review the discussions uh, with our, you know, with our interview uh, interviewees, et cetera, and come up with the key points then for our particular cluster and make sure that those were then presented at the, you know, at the, at the following um, full commission meeting. And so I, I didn't know if there was a process like that or what was really yeah. done with this. No, group. I just kind of called on everybody. I, I would ask commissioner Bobo at the public meeting, if she had any particular input pertaining to our work group or any recommendations that, so everyone had their own individual autonomy pertaining to their, position or um, takeaways or perspectives pertaining to our work group. And I mean, Commissioner Bobo, you can tell me if it did and if it flowed well enough for you to have input or insight at public meetings or work group meetings, but it, we kind of all just added in and we provided yeah, our I mean, pertaining to it. Yeah, I, I do. Um, I kind of recognize that there might be uh, perhaps like a meeting in the middle where um, I, I appreciate the approach that uh, Commissioner Crossland and I believe you were part of, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Commissioner Intagliata's group before. And yeah. so both of you had, um, I believe, typed out, uh, you know, maybe either recommendations or um, things that you had noted as, a, as it pertained to um, the articles themselves and kind of based on the feedback that was gleaned uh, from, for example, today's interviews that we that we held. Um, and so it might be advantageous for us either via email or some other method to summarize some thoughts um, based on the two individuals that we did hear from uh, and then, you know, present those in, in a standardized format to the entire body. I, I we if, if that's kind of that. what I'm you're getting at. Now, see. I believe we had from our first several meetings, we had feedback that we sent each other, follow up. I'm going to look now. And we all did an email synopsis because we had Secretary Bobo here. We did, I wanna ask, I'm looking at four email synopsis of our total like, summary of our meetings our work group meetings in order to build upon that at the next work group meeting. So we were already functioning in a kind of a follow-up fashion. But if there's something you want formally, I don't have an, I don't think it's an issue with doing it. I don't think it's anything beyond that. But my, my preference maybe is because can, I think- I was just thinking maybe we can reverse engineer it to say what do we think is the most uh, advantageous based on what we've learned today what is the most advantageous for the entire body and the public to hear about based on what was discussed today and then kind of think through what those types of updates would look like uh, I didn't mean to, I didn't intend to cut you off though Commissioner Crossland go ahead oh no no I, I had jumped in thinking you were done so excuse me so yeah. I think that we can do some bullet points. I have some here. I can send you all my bullet points. You all can add yours and we can do a combined list and we can reference it at the public meeting. 
or are you all suggesting that one person speaks to the total work group meeting pertaining to all the items that we list? Well, to tell you the truth, my my preference would be that we um, that we organize it in such a way that we that each of us have some specific responsibilities rather than um, be uh, responsible for all. I think it makes sense for a couple of reasons. One is because then we can focus particularly on a, a, a on certain areas in terms of becoming a little bit more knowledgeable of them, but also just because I think we're going to get so mired in so much information that with each of these interviews that that we continue to take, it's just going to grow and grow. And so to the degree that each of us can segment what we have to keep on top of, um, the better off we'll be in terms of our time management on top of every, in our knowledge base. Um, I, I can, I have a, go ahead. I could make a document in the Google Drive and just send it to each person and you can put your thoughts in there so that it'll all be in the same place and whatever else. And if you, um, if you want us to put that email in the work group folder as well, that could be another way to do it. I think that works, Commissioner Hamilton. I don't, I'm be helpful. not, I'm definitely on the fence about separating out the articles again amongst the work group members, primarily because we were put, we agreed as a commission to do the total group, work group function on all the articles that we assigned those particular work groups to divide them again within the work groups, I think omits the collaborative working together on the ones that we were assigned. Just just to clarify, there was no intention of, of uh, only only studying or or segmenting to the degree where, for instance, I would deal with only personnel or something like that, but simply for reporting purposes that if uh, you know we would we would be we would be learning together, we would be asking questions together, we would in fact be providing feedback to each other. But just in terms of the actual presentations themselves, that um, instead of each of us presenting on three or four different subject areas that might have um, uh, might have occurred uh, since the last since the last full commission meeting, um, we each would sort of have a particular area we'd be presenting on. That would be the only difference. Otherwise, it would be the continuation of the collaboration that we had uh, that we had agreed to, and um, that I think we're following. I'm all, I'm okay either way. I still I think in 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 order to stay in alignment with what you all discussed in November with everyone having equal and individual empowerment in order to discuss each and every aspect of this work, it's important that everybody speaks pertaining to everything and everybody has input or is given the opportunity to have input on every aspect of the work in the article including what we're doing in the work group. So I think in order to stay in alignment with what you all discussed in November, that it's important to keep it as open as possible for everyone to have insight and input on all aspects of both the articles, the process, and the work itself, including the communication. So I think Commissioner Hamilton, with the email that you're going to send with the folders and the updates pertaining to this work group meeting that includes all of the work we've done thus far pertaining. I thought it was interesting that you all agreed with myself and Commissioner Bobo and Vice Chair's aspect of the language changes and the consistency. I think about, I thought that was the most interesting part to me pertaining to what we heard on today is the consistency pertaining to the titling, pertaining to the actual responsibilities and pertaining to how it's, you know, formatted and functioned, I think is important to bring up in the public meeting for our work group that the actual interviewers that we had, interviewees that we had agreed with the approach of consistency pertaining to the article being if we, as a total commission concentrated on the articles reflecting consistency, that it should be a worthwhile amendment across the board. 
that would be the only thing that I would like to make sure is on our bulleted list to bring up to the commission at the next meeting. Well, one of the things that also I heard the judge say um, several times was that less was more and um, that instead of trying to include everything in uh, the charter, that we should really focus on the framework itself. And I know that that's been something that uh, has been a point of discussion as part of the commission um, approach as well. But um, but I have to say personally that um, that um, uh, the best charter from my point of view, the one that will grow and live the longest will be the one that uh, that won't try to define everything, but will in fact just provide um, a sound structure. I also thought it was interesting. I know Commissioner Hamilton, you're gonna put the ordinances in into the folder that he referenced. I think it's important for all the commissioners to understand. I plan to put forth some motions um, this next meeting to assist with what I'm about to say, but it's important for us to understand what a governing document is and how it functions. And the fact that we have ordinances that we're actually abiding by or utilizing and the charter functioning as that governing document, it's important for it to remain simple, but it's also important for people to be able to source access and understand those ordinances as the charter is being amended or whatever the case may be pertaining to it. So it's some disconnect, but I'm gonna, put forth some ordinances so people can present in a special meeting forum to explain how the two work together. I think that is a little bit of a disconnect, but I'm glad that he brought that up today, that the ordinances are in support of or in alignment with the charter itself. The charter being a simple governing document is important to give room for those ordinances to be created for departments, officials, and everyone else in the city to pretty much function. So I think that those are great points to bring up that he mentioned. The ordinances are a crucial part of how the city governs itself pertaining to the charter as a governing document. And I, I went ahead and sent the email that has links to the um, note document and I added the note that I wrote, that I mentioned about the city residency preemption and the reference to the charter, and then the city marshal. I know we talked about that after local control. That's just part of the police now, and so I think it can be removed entirely. Um, so I put that in there, and anything else you want to put in there, you can put in we there. We appreciate and, it. We appreciate you guys on the meetings too. Yeah, and I and I went ahead and saved the ordinance that was referenced. It's titled Municipal Court Ordinances. Great. Councillor Hamilton, just a quick question. Um, if something has been changed because state law changes uh, or or something like that, um, and therefore it's no longer uh, relevant to the charter, can we just remove that or do we have to do something formal to remove it? Um, you have to do something formal to remove it. You, okay. you, you're saying, can we delete it without? Yeah, yeah, because okay. if, if if law changed or something, is it? You can't is enforce it, it because it's preempted. So the court okay. won't enforce it because it's preempted. But you still have to take it yes, out. Yes, yes you do. Uh, okay. Yeah, I'm just trying, I'm trying to, I'm trying, you know, it's like simplicity. I'm trying to figure out what we can do that simplifies. Yeah, okay. Okay, if we have nothing else to add, you guys, we're going to wait on the email that we should all have. I'm going to check all of my emails today pertaining to the commission. And I believe that we are set and ready to go for our June, January 10th meeting that should be scheduled for everybody to be in the other location, the new location, correct? Okay, so we're good to go. This work group has a January 10th meeting. Yes. It's going to be here, you know, on this Zoom. Yes. The physical meeting is on January the 8th. January the 8th. And it will be in, in the Kennedy Room in City Hall. In it Kennedy. should be on everybody's calendar by now, yes. Mm -hmm. So we're good to go. Confusing. Hi. Thank you, ladies. Tierra again, welcome. We appreciate you. Thank you. Have a okay. good one. Bye bye. Thank you.